Yo. Hello, hello. Um Hello everybody. Um hello. Welcome to Sin Pajas, the podcast where I try to be as honest as possible and talk about stuff. Um I might say um a lot because this is literally the first episode, my first ever recording. I probably should have done like a test beforehand. Maybe this will be the test. Who knows? Maybe I won't release this one. Maybe I will. I, I'm pretty sure I will. But yeah, without further ado, welcome to Sin Pajas. Sin Pajas. Sin Pajas itself, the reason why I chose the name Sin Pajas uh, is because, well, Sin Pajas is a Chapinismo, I think. And Chapinismo is like a Guatemalanized way of saying a word. Because um, Baja itself, well, I mean, right now I've got Urban Dictionary, which is probably not the best source to look at what it means, but it says Baja is a caliche. I don't know what caliche, meaning lie. So a pajero is a liar. And also Baja can mean straw or masturbate, but we're not using it in any of those two contexts. But yeah, so sin pajas, so no bullshit. Welcome. Uh, I'm very, very, first of all, very excited, very nervous too, uh, to be doing this. And without further ado, I think I've said that multiple times anyway. Uh, I'm also, so what this episode is all about is I will lay out what the podcast itself is going to be, what the show is, what the main, well, not main topics, but what the main, yeah, what the main discussion topics will be but it will be pretty much about all my areas of interest in this world this rock that we all live in and the weirdness and all the different ways that people live and interact with each other without really paying too much attention to them uh i just want to quickly check that everything is okay everything's recording you can hear me um Cool, 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 cool whip. I've been saying that a lot. Uh, so, yeah, further ado. My name is Ignacio Parellada. Uh, I was born in Leeds, and I grew up in Guatemala. Guatemala. Um, and I now live in Bristol, in the United Kingdom. And so the reason why I created this show, and I'm creating this podcast, and also my website where you can probably find the podcast and some future artistic videos is I want to use this platform and use this show in order to spread awareness and spread just my experience with mental health and mental health illnesses that affect probably most of our species and the re the fact that we don't talk about it, the fact that it's been a taboo for so long, is is just baffling. It's it's is really 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 hard to understand. So this is one of the main reasons why this podcast is being created. Another reason is I just want to share with everyone who might be interested in taking a look at my path through life, like the things I learn my own improvements, my own faults. Uh, don't be too harsh on my faults because we're all human, we're all not perfect. And it's okay. And it's okay not to be perfect. And it's okay not to be okay. That's a very cool phrase, by the way. And it's just literally accepting how you are and who you are. But that is also not entirely correct. Uh, and here is why. Um, well, people, people most of the time say, well, or they've, we've been taught as kids in a lot of ways. Well, it's, I think it's the fallacy behind loving yourself because of who you are. Yeah, that sounds very nice and pretty. And yeah, I agree with it. Like you should like who you are, but not if you're an asshole or not if you're a dickhead or, or if not, if you're not nice to other people, no, you shouldn't like who you are. And I think it's complete bullshit. Like, if you don't... So I, I wrote a bit about this. And if you don't like who you are, 
or who you have become as a person, don't accept it and, and embrace it. Just work actively to change and fix yourself to actually become someone who you would be proud of being. And why the reason why I'm saying this is because I was very comfortable with the person who I was. But also at the same time, I was very, very troubled with who I was because I wasn't sure exactly who I was or what I was in the first place. I didn't, I never had that pause, never had that time to really think what I am and who I am or what my beliefs really were as an individual without just repeating stuff that I've been taught my entire life, which is incredible how maybe most people live their lives just repeating stuff they've been taught without questioning. And there's also definitely a limit in how much you should question things. Because if you get trapped in that loop of questioning and questioning and obsess on some questions, well, you might tend to get depressed. Because most of these questions don't really have very clear answers. And some people might pretend that they know these answers because they haven't questioned, questioned their own lives themselves. So, yeah, moving on. Uh, so, my experience with depression and anxiety. Um, so, I went through high school, and like many kids, I don't know if high school was a fantastic experience or not, but I had, I had a nice time in high school. I had good friends, and most of my time in high school was also trying to avoid conflict because I wasn't very comfortable with conflict. And I was also, well, I'm just, I'm, I was just literally this little ape, this, <laughs> this teen with some acne, like pretty fat and some eating disorders, etc., cetera, et cetera. And throughout high school, I never really learned how to treat myself with love and kindness or treat myself with respect. Or really how to take care of myself in the sense of my own well-being and my mental health. And and I've come to accept that it's okay. It's okay not to know these things as long as you're actively trying to work on them. There, so high school happened. I went to a really, really, really nice school, by the way, in a very, very poor country. So I am, I acknowledge the fact that I am a very lucky person, that I had very nice, lovable parents and who took care of me and really wanted the best thing for me, which is, in most cases, most parents want the best for their children, regardless of if what they're teaching them is the best thing for them. But in their minds, it will always be in order to help them and give them the best tools in life. Uh, after high school, I joined uh, a university in Guatemala to study politics and international relations because I had this 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 weird obsession, this weird idea that I really wanted to to make a positive change in this world through the UN, through the United Nations. I I, I had the goal of being the um, what's it called, the secretary, the general secretary, the president of the United Nations, secretary general, the secretary general of the United Nations, and. I was actively working towards that. So, the, and without really, really knowing or challenging my own beliefs and really being sure about what I knew. And I felt like the top of the world. I was super, super confident or overconfident is a better word of, is a better way of putting it. Um, and I never really got to explore my own beliefs. So university in Guatemala was weird, <laughs> very weird. And in a way, I was looking for a way out, out of my own mental struggles. Not the drastic way out, at least not at the moment, but I found a purpose. I was looking for a purpose, actually. I was looking for, I was always drawn towards a military lifestyle and the discipline and the honor and the companionship and the lifelong friends that you look in the movies and how they really take care of each other. So I applied or I started the process of applying to join the Royal Navy. 
because I was born in Leeds, I have UK a, a British passport. So that allowed me also to be able to apply to the Royal Navy. So I spent a few months during my first year, well, during the end of my first year in the uni, applying to become a Royal Naval officer. And after failing some English writing tests, ah, I was really gutted. I was really, really gutted. And I thought I was a problem. I probably didn't revise enough for it. Well, study. Um, in American English, we tend to say study instead of revise. That was a really, really big, weird shock for me when I came to the UK. It was like, everyone was like, oh, have you revised? How's revision going? I'm like, what, what, what the fuck are you talking about? Revision, revise, what, what is that? And I was like, study. No, yeah, I'm studying. But now, no, revise. Yeah, revise, revision. Word swiggy. Da, 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 da. <laughs> um, so, yes, uh, I was going through the Royal Navy application process. And at one point in Guatemala, I was like, okay, so I need money. <laughs> I need money to pay for my plane ticket. I need money or... I just need resources in order to go to my interviews and do all this necessary steps in order to join the Navy. And eventually I told my parents and it was not a nice conversation. I, uh, they were definitely very, very shocked at the fact that I wanted to join the Navy in at the other side of the world, in the other side of the world. Uh, so because I had failed the English academic writing test, I decided to join or to start my studies in the UK, in the university, with the main goal of joining the Navy. Not because of the studies themselves. And I came to Bristol in 2017 or 16, and I started my... Well, actually, I did loads of research on these university royal naval units. And I found out there was one in Bristol, so I applied... Before applying to the university, I applied to the naval units, which is which which works kind of like a society. So there's a total of I think fourteen Royal Naval units. Don't take my word for it. Uh, I might be wrong. And in fourteen leading UK universities, and it just happens that Bristol was one of them. And I said, okay, cool. So I'll get a degree in order to join the navy. So I came to Bristol. Um, after getting accepted to the university itself, which I didn't think it was that much of a big deal. I was more excited about... I was more nervous, actually, about my naval interview than the university interview. And that was funny. That was very funny. Well, maybe not funny, but it was interesting. So I got accepted into the university, and then eventually I got accepted into the naval unit, and I continued slash started my studies here. And that went was going pretty well. I was also starting to get involved in loads of different stuff. And it was also the first taste, like the actual taste of freedom I had. So I had some sort of taste of freedom back in Guatemala when I was going to university there. And without really understanding what it was, because the way universities in Guatemala or the people who have the opportunity to go to a higher education in Guatemala is you tend to still live with your parents. You tend to still uh, live at home and then commute to classes because you live relatively close to university because all the big, major, good universities in Guatemala happen to be in Guatemala City. And I happened to live in Guatemala City. Most of my course mates happened to live in Guatemala City. And so when I came here, it was also kind of like a culture shock because I, I, it's so many young people, so many students, so many kids. Like I'm, I'm also considering myself a kid. Just leaving home at a very, very early stage in their life, without having necessarily having all the proper tools to go out and be independent. You're cooking your food, laundry. Um, discipline, oh, discipline is a very big one, and you get you get presented into this world, this with this huge, huge, huge world of unlimited possibilities that I didn't think were possible. 
So within that world, you have you have alcohol, you have drugs, you have sex, and all these taboos that in Guatemalan society or culture are really, really, really alien to most people. So that was a very interesting year. And oh, I should also say a bit of context about my upbringing. Upbringing, I was raised as a Catholic. I was a very, very conservative family, very conservative Catholic family. So loads of these things that appeared to be normal here were absolutely alien to someone like me. So slowly, I started feeling a bit more comfortable with certain stuff, things, and um, behaviors, which at the same time, there was also this massive, massive just feeling of guilt this just this this feeling that I was doing something very very wrong and the first time I ever bumped into someone who taught me what the term catholic guilt was I'm I'm throwing things in the air by the way and was my very good friend Callum and so I've got a definition here that what catholic guilt is we'll quote wikipedia yeah, this isn't the most intellectual intellectual podcast in the world. So so I've got definition here. Catholic guilt is the reported excess guilt felt by Catholics and lapsed Catholics. A lapsed Catholic is a baptized Catholic who is non-practicing. Such a person may still identify as a Catholic and remains a Catholic according to canon law. So the term Catholic guilt is considered as pejorative against Catholics and Catholics ethics in general. Guilt is a byproduct of an informed conscience, but Catholic guilt is often confused with scrupulosity. I don't know what scrupulosity means, so scrupulosity is characterized by pathological guilt about moral or religious issues. It is personally distressing, mm -hmm, objectively dysfunctional, mm -hmm, and often accompanied by significant impairment in social functioning. So that makes a lot of sense, because I, I was part of this, like, society who used to go drinking every week. And there was... Well, I'm not talking specifically about the naval society. I'm talking about other societies, which I also belonged to. And, well, drinking is a very big thing in a lot of areas in the world, especially university life. You're exposed to this freedom. You have this money available to spend. And maybe you don't have the necessary tools or knowledge of how to be spending this money in the first place. And that can be very, very tricky and challenging, especially if you don't know what you're doing. And without knowing really, well, without knowing a lot about what the psychological repercussions and chemical changes that are happening in your body due to the amount of alcohol being consumed on a weekly basis. So this, this, this topic goes related to freedom and my experience coming to Bristol and having that first taste of freedom alongside the amount of responsibilities I was acquiring due to my studies, due to my commitment to the Navy and the commitment to socializing and friends and also struggling a lot to be a very faithful Catholic person. Um, so taking all that into context and grabbing all that experience I eventually felt too much pressure too much pressure too many panic attacks that I didn't even know were panic attacks I didn't even know what a panic attack was until until I went pretty much to therapy or actually no until I started reading some self-help books about panic attacks and even considering therapy because I didn't used to believe in psychology in the first place I was like, oh, no, what? Psychology? Pfft, therapy? Pfft, that's for weak-minded people. That's for people who really are fucked up in their heads. That's for murderers, and that's for serial killers. What, psychology? Pfft. I would laugh at people's faces. I used to be really mean. <laughs> um, so, and, and th I used to always have this thought that, oh, psychologists and psychiatrists are definitely way more fucked up than normal people, and that's why... That's the reason why they went into practice it, which is not entirely untrue. 
there's a lot of psychologists and a lot of psychiatrists who have a lot of issues, which is why they're really interested in this field of science, which is, it is a science. So that was one of the things I learned, that psychology is an actual science, and it is actually beneficial to humans and their minds. It is the study of understanding the human mind. So after informing myself of all this, because I had some sort of crisis during my first year at university, and I will talk a bit more about that in a future video, and definitely I'll talk more specifically about the medical terms and the psychological terms of my illness um, in another video, which will probably go more into detail with the conversations I'll have with people who definitely know a lot more about this than I do. And so at the end of my first academic year in Bristol, I found myself in a very, very, very bad situation, uh, mentally wise and health wise, due to a lot of things I did not understand about myself and about the world. And it is very interesting how the mind, how the human mind tends to build these walls, tends to have these defense mechanisms. So a few of the defense mechanisms that we might have are repression, uh, denial, projection, displacement, regression, and sublimination. So I, in my case, I think a lot of denial, denial and projection probably was a huge part, and regression, well, a lot of them, a huge part of my daily life that I'd never really acknowledged. So when I started actually trying to get better, I started doing meditation. Well, I started exploring the idea of meditation Obviously, I had to struggle with myself and negotiate with myself that I would actually meditate. But the reason why I even started meditating in the first place wasn't because, oh, yeah, I want to be this this, this guru and I want to I wanna have peace of mind. <laughs> no. Um, it was because I found this app called Headspace and it had this SOS option, which was like an emergency option to help you calm down if you're having a panic attack. And I should also lay, lay, define what panic attacks are. So, panic attack is an involve. It involves sudden feelings of terror that strike without warning. These episodes can occur at any time, even during sleep. That's that's intense. People experiencing a panic attack may believe they are having a heart attack, or they are dying, or going crazy. The fear and terror that a person experiences during a panic attack are not in propor proportion to the true situation and may be unrelated to what is happening around them. Most people with panic attacks experience several of the following symptoms. Racing hot, feeling weak, faint or dizzy, tingling or numbness in the hands and fingers, a sense of terror or impeding, impending doom or death, feeling sweaty or having chills, chest pains, breathing difficulties, and feeling a loss of control. They tend... They generally last less than 10 minutes, although some of the symptoms may persist for a longer time. People who have had one panic attack are at greater risk of having subsequent panic attacks than those who have never experienced a panic attack. When the attacks occur repeatedly, and there is worry about having more episodes, a person is considered to have a condition known as panic disorder. So my relationship with panic attacks was a very tricky one, because the... So how I started regulating my own heart rate and really, really un trying to understand what was going physiologically and psychologically in my body started with these SOS meditations, and which are pretty much just telling, it's this, this, this very soothing voice telling you to be calm, telling you to breathe, telling you that it's, it's okay, just... And really just bring down your heart rate. They definitely didn't explain all these technical issues during the meditation process or the um, SOS meditation, which lasted one minute, two minutes, which surprisingly was kind of enough to calm down all the crazy train of thoughts that happened during a panic attack. And it is very, very helpful just to breathe and just to understand what breathing is. And one thing, just a little parenthesis, one thing I find amazing 
about humans and about our education system is the lack of teaching people how to breathe and how to regulate their own heartbeat and how to really teach kids to have a clear thought process. And that is baffling. That is that's really, really, really something I struggle to understand. And how It's actually quite a miracle if you think about society and how everything tends to kind of chaotically fall into place <laughs> without us knowing everything that happens. Because if, if you would know everything that happens, you would go insane. If you think about everything, you would go insane. You cannot handle that amount of information. Like, we're not wired to know everything. And But it's just these basic survival skills that we don't get taught is very, very confusing to me, which is something that I really want to talk about more often in during the podcast. And another thing that they maybe don't tend to teach us in most in some cases or most cases and i'm talking about maybe my guatemalan education considering that it was a very good education is how everyone has downtime and how downtime is actually something normal and downtime is a part of life and so life is kind of like a wavelength you usually have nice times you have happy times you have down times and you have happy times you have down times you have struggles you have really nice times. <laughs> and just the lack of teaching us of what that is, is very confusing. So, so, so to conclude that little parenthesis is that everyone has downtime and it is okay to feel down. It is okay not to be okay. Uh, so I've talked about the importance of breathing and oxygen flow. Like it's so important to have oxygen reach our brains and reach every part of our body. So that we can calm down and actually have a clear thought process. So this is all that just like the tip of the iceberg about what this podcast is going to be. But I'm going a bit more into this particular topic a bit because I think it's very important and is one of the main reasons why this podcast exists. So a few useful ways that I've found that help alleviate panic attacks, help alleviate... Um, depressive episodes or or negative thoughts are well first of all therapy if you think you're struggling if you think you're going crazy or if you think you would find useful to have a second perspective on your life seek help fuck it just fuck it just seek help because because you, you're not capable of doing it on your own you're just simply not and if you think you are, you might be in denial. So it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to seek help. And if you can't afford a therapist, seek help to your closest friends, your inner social circle. And if you don't have any friends, if you don't have a social circle, oh, that can be tough. Push yourself a tiny bit just to maybe try to socialize with someone. And that can be so intimidating. I understand how intimidating that can be for someone who's a very big introvert and who's never talked about his problems, his or her problems in any occasion. That can be very, very, very hard. But it comes with practice. Everything comes with practice. You will get comfortable eventually talking about your stuff and about your issues if you just start. A very good tip I would give people who are struggling and don't have someone to go to is speak about your problems in front of the mirror, in front of yourself. Just formulate what is going on in your head into words and very, really communicate it to the world. To just, just, just let those words turn into sound and really, 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 oh. So my camera just crashed, but this podcast will continue without it anyway. And yeah, actually, I'll change the battery on the camera and I'll be back in a second. Okay. Uh, where was I? <sighs> yeah. Speak to yourself in the mirror. Formulate your words. Formulate your, your, your issues, your problems, what you're struggling with, at least with yourself. And then become comfortable with it so you can then say it out loud to someone else who might give you a hand. Uh, other things you can do to help out and alleviate it is 
habits, the food you're eating, sunlight, exercise, just just friendship. And with that in mind, exercise is very, very important because you need the natural release of endorphins in your head. And if you're not getting enough sunlight or exercise, well, just don't bullshit yourself because we all know we can tend to bullshit ourselves and get locked into these like patterns of thought and we just like oh but I'm, i know i'm okay like oh i don't need this like oh but it's so tough yeah yeah i know yeah definitely it's tough but so ask yourself do you want to get better or not it might sound a bit harsh but it is true and i understand the perspective of some people when they say oh but like you're being really tough you can't just tell someone to to get their shit together without understanding what they're going through definitely no i understand that perfectly because some people might not even realize that they have problems but it all comes down to not bullshitting yourself like we all try to understand ourselves the best we can and we all can tend to lie to ourselves in order to believe certain truths about ourselves uh yeah so just try to be healthier that's so general that's so ambiguous and yeah so my message to everyone is take care of yourself and treat yourself with love and kindness breathe and forgive yourself too forgiveness is a big thing we don't get taught or we don't tend to get thought we taught we get we get taught that forgiving other people is good and it is necessary to be able to live in peace but do we really get taught to forgive ourselves and then after we have forgiven ourselves work towards improving what we needed to forgive ourselves for in the first place so that said um i hope you enjoyed the first episode uh, it won't be oh every episode won't be about this by the way um there's some fun episodes coming up and some very interesting guests that i have lined up um um now yeah so i really really hope you guys enjoyed it uh and without further ado ciao everybody <laughs>